what you see on the screen right now, you can take a picture of with your phone. You guys all know what those things are. And after you take a picture of that, it will take you to this, which is the University of Utah School of Dentistry YouTube channel. And you'll find lots of videos in there. If you're interested in mine, you just scroll down and here they are. There's 12 of them. And the one over on the right is the one we're doing today. So if at any time you want to go back and review it, it's right there. Any questions about that? And also, this lecture that we're doing right now is being recorded, so it's also probably going to wind up on the YouTube channel. Thanks, Dr. Thorell. Okay. So we are going to deal with a situation where you're going to be in your office. You get a call. And one of your young patients has just fallen off the bike or got hit in the mouth with a baseball or something of that nature and fractured off the incisal edge of a tooth. Now, there's two ways to do this. One of them would be if you have a study model of that patient, you could make a putty index and, and use that. But a lot of times that doesn't happen because... It's just an accident. So I'm going to give you a technique where you can restore that with composite without an index. But I'm going to suggest that today, I think you'll have time to do the technique that I'm showing you. And we will grade that one. And then when you finish it, you can do the other central incisor and use the index to do the buildup. Because you can make the index before you start. So let's see if I can find the, the lecture here. Okay, these are our objectives, to learn how to diagnose and treat anterior teeth that have lost the incisal edge. You all know what a class three is. That's a cavity in the proximal surface, or the aproximal surface of an anterior tooth. This is the next step when they've lost the incisal edge. Learn the techniques to prepare, restore, finish, polish this type of restoration. Now, You've had a lot of experience with uh, composite, and, and you know how to use the instruments, but we're going to be applying them in a slightly different way today. So this is just a typical case. I took this um, photograph in my office 30 years ago. You can see with the incisal edges lost. There's a, a class three and tooth number eight. Tooth number seven, the incisal edge is gone. And tooth number 10, the incisal edge is fractured off. So this is how it looks after it's restored. So it's a conservative approach. We don't remove much tooth structure. We can get good aesthetics. And it's long-lasting if you do it properly. Now, composites have a lifespan of about five to seven years. But I'm, pr I'm uh, proposing that if you do it the way I'm going to show you today, it's going to be for good for 20 years or longer. But it has to be done properly. If you leave out one step or don't do one of the steps completely the way you should, then it's going to be compromised. So that's what you're going to be presented with. And sooner or later, that's what you're going to, somebody's going to come in your office 
and they're going to be all shook up. Now, if if it's a evening, like if they call at night or it's on a weekend, and you don't really have time to do the whole procedure, you just take some glass ionomer, and you dry the tooth off, you dab it off, put some glass ionomer and protect it, and then have them come back when you have time to do it. If you have time to do it, then fine, you go ahead and, and do the procedure, but uh, sometimes there's bleeding, sometimes there's tears, sometimes there's anxious parents, and so some glass ionomer cement over that fracture and then reschedule when you can when things have calmed down. So what can we do for this patient? Well, we can do something like that. Now, in the meantime, okay, we restore number eight, and you can see we can get pretty fancy and uh, we can put translucencies in it. We can use mam we can make mammalons internally with a little bit darker shade, and we can really make that tooth look pretty nice. Now, in the meantime, um, that's been restored. But what's going on with number nine now? Apparently, it got knocked at the same time, and then it, that incisal edge fractured off. So we can do this, the same procedure on that that we did on number eight. It's just quite a bit smaller. But the, all the principles are going to be the same. So the question is, what do we need to do now for the patient? Well, we need to go ahead and do a class four on number nine. So this is from a textbook. And if you look carefully at the diagram, you'll see that what, what they're proposing here is that you just bevel on the labial and the lingual. And so that's what I did. But I had some of them come off. So I modified it a little bit. So what I did was extend the coverage over the enamel further up the tooth, and I used something called a chamfer. Now, do you guys know what a chamfer is? That's because you haven't had fixed prosthodontics yet. In fixed prosthodontics, you're going to be cutting crown preparations, and these are the, the way you're going to be finishing those with a chamfer. So you're going to be introduced to that right now. now. Next semester, you'll be getting, uh, you'll be in fixed prosthodontics and you'll be cutting these. So you're getting an introduction. It can be done with a longer bevel. The reason I like a chamfer is because it makes it stronger. You've got a little bit of thickness of composite there to really grab the tooth and if it's going to get hit really hard or they're biting into something like a frozen candy bar, uh, they, they, they hold up better. So my idea was to convert the one millimeter bevel to a two millimeter incisal gingival chamfer. It's only a half a millimeter deep axially because we want to have plenty of enamel to bond to. If you cut all the way through the enamel, then you're bonding to dentin and it's not going to be as, as sturdy. So any question about that? If you take an 016 diamond, which you have on your black burr block, and measure it, it um, half of the width of the tip is a half millimeter. So, and we're going to be using that diamond. Now, if you're insecure about using a large diamond, there's an 012 diamond, which is about just a half a millimeter deep, and you can use that. So either way is OK. So that's what is that what what creates a chamfer. So it gives you a nice finish line, and it also gives you some bulk of material there, so that you have the strength. And that's what a chamfer looks like up close. So you'll be living with us in fixed prosthodontics for the rest of your career, and you're going to learn it today how to produce that, and. Uh, 
If you're not sure exactly how to do it, we've got plenty of faculty here to help you out. So here's another case, fractured tooth. Now this one actually involves the, the entire size of edge, doesn't it? Still class four. And there's the finished restoration. We haven't gotten into details yet, but we will as to how you do this. This would be a young patient where we have a multi-shaded tooth, but usually in older patients, the incisal edge is worn down and then the tooth is more monochromatic. It's all one color. So we're not going to restore. We're going to, we're going to match what's there on the other tooth. If it's monochromatic, then that's what we're going to match. If it's multi-shade, we're going to do that. You won't be doing that in the lab today. <laughs> okay, so going back to our preparation on that, uh, if it's going to be multi-shaded, then we're going to use a hybrid core on the lingual. That means that light won't pass through it because if we use translucent shade on the whole thing, and the patient smiles, the darkness in the back of it's gonna show through and you're gonna see it's not gonna look very good. So we have to block out the light with the dentin shade, the opaque, but then on the labial, we can use an enamel shade and we can, can vary that. So we're not gonna do all that in the lab, but I just want you to understand that that's how you do it. Now, I mentioned about a putty matrix. So in this case, this is what the putty matrix looks like, and then you can use that to restore the lingual and form the composite on the lingual. But if you don't have one of these, then we'll, I'll show you how to do it. So when a patient presents with a fractured tooth, we can make the putty matrix on a study. You can make it on a study model if you have one, and then, um, but, <clears throat> and then there's another way to do it too. You can do a mock-up. You can take some composite and just paste it on there and shape it real quick and then take the putty matrix. But um, that takes extra time, so we'll get into the technique. Okay, so if you have a putty matrix, then you can put in, you can just put that composite in there and form it and light cure it. Then you can take some dentin shade and form the mammalons. So this is pretty high tech, but you'll, be, you'll learn to do it. And you can get a result like that. So you see where the artistic part begins to come in? <laughs> uh, we're not just doing a class one or a class two. We're, we're doing something right in front of the mouth it has to match the, the adjacent tooth. Okay, this is a case that I did in my office, and I, I'm gonna show it to you because I just, I, there's a couple of interesting things about it. Now, when you look at a patient and their teeth are worn off like that, then the, the light should come on in your mind that we need to deal with the, the etiology and what, what caused it. So the first thing I did was ask the patient, when do you grind your teeth? Obviously, the patient's grinding it. So if the patient was doing it at night and they couldn't control it, then after we restored the teeth, what would we have to do to protect our restoration? Make a protective splint, right. In this particular case, this, this was like 30 years ago, this patient worked at IBM and he was a programmer. And he said he was, it was a very stressful job and that he grind, would grind his teeth while he was working. And I said, well, now that I've pointed out to you that you're doing that, do you think you could stop? And he said, well, I'll try. And he did. He was able to control it. So sometimes you can just talk to the patient about it. So we went in <coughs> and uh, you see where the discoloration is and the crack on the labial? I just took a thin diamond and cleaned that out 
and then built up the incisal edges. So we we restored eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Now his teeth were monochromatic to begin with, so I didn't get fancy and vary the shade and use translucencies. I just uh, made the tooth all one color. Now. I like to close diastomas, I don't like spaces, but the patient asked me not to close the diastema because people would think he looked different or something. He, he sort of liked having a little space there. So we left it open. Okay, let's follow through into the future. So this is the before picture. And can you kind of visualize in your mind how you would approach this? I hope. Okay. So here he is eight years later. Came in for recall and have his teeth checked and cleaned. And lo and behold, the diastema has closed. Now, what do you think could have caused that? Because I didn't close it. And he hadn't been to another dentist. But it was open when we finish the case, but now eight years later, it's closed. Anybody got any ideas? Good answer. Okay, the anterior component of force or mesial drift. So let's think about it for a minute. If you look at the dentition from a lateral view, you notice how the roots are sort of inclined distally a little bit. So that means that every time these teeth come together, there's an anterior component of force. Now what that does for us is, as our teeth, as we're chewing, teeth are moving, and they're kind of rubbing against each other, and it flattens out the uh, contacts. So that would create spaces, and what would spaces do you get food trapped in it and periodontal problems. So we have sort of a built-in mechanism with this anterior component of force that as the teeth wear in approximately, they close. Anybody ever thought about that before? You probably, it's happened in your own mouth. Now it doesn't always work <laughs> that way, but it's something you should be aware of. But that doesn't mean that if you have a, a loose contact on a class two, that this is going to take care of it. <laughs> you can't count on that. If you're restoring a tooth, you want to get good contacts. But I just wanted you to be aware of it. So when the posterior teeth are viewed from the side, the crowns are inclined to the mesial, so that when the teeth come together, there's this anterior component of force. Okay, so these are some big plaster models that I had many years ago at, at UOP that I used to use for teaching, but I thought they'd be helpful. So let's talk about this preparation. If the entire sizal edge is gone, we want to do like a little mini crown preparation. And it's two millimeters in sizal gingivally and a half a millimeter Axial. Any question about that? Okay. So looking at it from different views, on a canine, that would be the upper picture. That's what it's going to look like. And on the um, central, over to the right, and then the incisal view. So you haven't cut crown preparations yet, but this is what crown preparations look like, but it's just a little mini crown preparation. We don't want to remove any more tooth structure than we need to, but we want it to be strong and be long-lasting. Uh, this is a case I did where I had to lengthen the lower incisors because they were all worn down. So this is what the preparations look like on natural teeth. And so a rule of thumb is that when you're, in, you're adding to the incisal edge, you need at least one millimeter. Uh, if it's a half a millimeter, it has a tendency to fracture. So with those, I was going to build them up a millimeter. 
and there's a spoon. So we just did those one at a time and used Teflon tape. We do one, do te Teflon tape on it, do the next one, just work your way along. So you can do this and, um, on patients. Okay, so this is tongue and cheek. Bear with me. So using a laser or explosives is fast, but a little unpredictable. So we're going to use diamonds to do this, not burrs, diamonds. So, so far, have any of you used a diamond? No, you're going to today. So we're going to introduce you to diamond instruments. Just a quick review. Um, you're holding the handpiece in one hand, and you're using your thumb and index third finger. And then you're going to use a rest with your other hand to control that handpiece. So you have the luxury of two hands on the handpiece in this, this procedure. So the first thing you're going to do is create the fracture. So you're going to take an 012 diamond, which is a long, skinny one, and you're going to go slightly below the contact and about halfway across on the incisal edge. I hope that's clear to everybody. So you're going to create a fracture. So just work your way through from labial to lingual, and it'll just pop right off. Now we're going to do the preparation. So we talked about two millimeters incisal gingivally and a half millimeter axially. And I know I'm going over this and over this because but I'm doing that because I, I don't want you to over prepare. So let's watch it in action. So the first thing we're going to do is create that labial chamfer, and we're starting right where the edge of the fracture is. So that will be the first, first chamfer of your career, but there will be many more. Then we're, and be careful not to hit the adjacent tooth. Now we're going to go over to the lingual and do the same thing, but we can't see that directly, so we're going to do it through the mirror. But you're going to align it with the long axis of the tooth with direct vision. Then you're going to place the mirror in position. and watch through the mirror as that diamond prepares a chamfer on the lingual side. Now you've already learned to do this because when you start working on maxillary teeth when you were doing class ones and class twos, this is what you had to do. So it's kind of a review, but when you get into fixed prosthodontics, then you're going to be doing it exactly the same way. Now, in dental school, I was taught to just bevel the incisal edge. And I noticed that right where that bevel was, sometimes the composite would fracture. And then we had a little V to have to go back and repair it. So I got the idea of doing this, notching it. So you take that same instrument and come in and put a little notch right there. Now what that does for you is that that gives you the one millimeter of composite on the incisal edge where the patient's biting into apples and things and corn on the cob. And there's that gives you that strength so they don't break. Once I started doing this, I never had a problem after that. 
So we'll go, we, we need that one millimeter of material right there. Now, a lot of the things that we teach you are things that we learned the hard way. <laughs> this is one of them. So uh, take it to heart, but there's really no reason for you to have to go through that same learning curve and have to go back and repair them if you just do this. Now the only thing we have to do is connect the labial chamfer to the lingual chamfer and we go to the skinniest diamond we can find to do that. Without touching the adjacent tooth. And that's the, that's the, that's the prep. It's completed. Is there a question? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's what the preparation looks like. Can you see how the composite's going to grab onto that tooth and it's going to stay there and it's going to be long lasting? But the, this, this last cut, we want to make sure it's slightly below the contact so that we can get in there and, and restore it. Okay, so I've, I've talked about this before, that in dentistry we need to look at the tooth and then visualize in our mind what, where we're going and what we want it to look like and then make it happen. So let's watch this. So you're looking at the tooth, you're visualizing what it's going to look like, and then with your gifted hands, you're going to make it happen. So I don't think you're going to have too much trouble with this prep today. You've had enough experience now. The only thing I'm concerned about is that sometimes students will get a little carried away with the axial reduction and go over a half millimeter. So take it easy. We, we want to keep it in enamel. We don't want to be into the dent. So here's some different views of those plaster models. This is that. Okay, that was the. That's the labial. And there's the lingual. That's what it looks like from the proximal view. And that's what it looks like from the incisal. So you can just visualize how that composite is really grabbing onto that tooth and it's not going to let go. Because let's face it, we're putting an incisal edge on this tooth and, and we're not telling the patient to favor it. They're going to just chew normally and bite into things. And we don't want our restoration to chip or fall off. Okay, so now we're ready to go into the restoration. So first step, and you know how to do this because you've had a little experience with it, you're going to place Teflon tape on the adjacent tooth. And I apologize, I'm not wearing gloves when I did this, but I made this video over 30 years ago. So it didn't, didn't occur to me that I should wear gloves. But the technique hasn't changed in that, in that length of time. So you crimp that into the embrasures on the adjacent tooth. And then we etch, wash, dry, apply our bonding agent for 10 seconds. And all I'm showing here now is, you know, the only thing I'm really showing is applying the bonding agent. We've already etched and washed. And then you air thin that for 10 seconds because now the bonding agent I'm here using here is not as viscous as what we're using these days. So we didn't have to air thin it. But bonding agents now are very viscous and we need to air thin them out. And then we light cure it for 20 seconds. Okay. Take some composite and we're going to be using the opaque shade. Now I don't know, we probably won't be doing this in the lab, but just remember you always on the lingual want to use something that won't let the darkness show through. 
and back them out. But take your plastic instrument and cover the lingual margin. Now, if you were using a, uh, a matrix or an index, you do the same thing. You cover the margin and then push the matrix in to, push, to form the lingual. But, we're not, but if we don't have one, then I'm going to show you how to do it. So cover that margin. Then take a mylar strip and put a bend right in the middle of it, a right angle. So it looks like that. Then place that in, and this is what is going to help you to, after the composite is on the lingual, you can take your finger and push it up against the lingual so you don't have a lot of excess. So after you place the composite on the lingual, you just push your finger against the lingual of it. Now let's watch a video of that. Putting the matrix in. And then your finger goes up against the lingual. So now you can add more composite and your finger's backing up that matrix. Now I'm not trying to fill the whole tooth. We're going to do this in three increments. The first increment is the lingual increment. And that's what we're doing right now. Notice that as I'm packing that in, that I'm also removing the little overhang on the gingival because it's easier to take it off when it's soft than it is after it's hard, after you polymerize it. So we're just trying to restore the lingual half of that defect. And we're filling the lingual half. We're making sure there are no overhangs. We're kind of patting it down. Now, I'm not bringing it all the way up the incisal edge, and you'll see why in just a minute. So this is the first increment. And then we're curing it from the labial for two reasons. One, because our finger is in the way. Two, because we want to kind of pull that composite to the tooth, and we've talked about that before. So we cure it through the lingual, or through the labial. Then take your finger off, or move your finger out of the way, and then cure it through the lingual. Okay, we no longer need the, the mylar strip, so we're going to take it out. Now, we really don't have a real good contact at this point because the mylar strip's kind of thick. But when we do the last increment, we'll be able to push it in there and, and up against the Teflon tape and get that. So we're going to remove the mylar strip. So there is a slight gap there. We don't have a real tight contact yet, but we'll get it. Okay, so that's the first increment. Any question about increment number one? Now we'll go to the second increment. Let's say that this patient has a kind of translucent area on their incisal edge. So then you can use, and I don't know if we have it in the lab, I don't think we do, but what we're using now is a translucent shade it doesn't block the light and lets the darkness show through. And you just roll it into a little sausage and lay it on there. And you'll notice 30 years ago, composite was a little stickier than it is now. Watch what happens when I slide that instrument over. With the composite we're using now, that doesn't happen. And I shouldn't be using my bare finger on this. It should be gloved. <laughs> but use your finger. Tap it down and shape it. And then detail with your half Hollenbeck. 
So what I'm doing right now is I'm forming an incisal embrasure. You guys know all about incisal embrasures because you had dental anatomy. But you see, we're not trying to fill the whole tooth. We're just doing that incisal edge. So let's go in and, and um, form that just a little bit more because it's easier to do when it's soft than it is when it's hard. <laughs> when it's hard, you're using the rotary instrument. So get that looking just the way you want it, and then cure it. So that's increment number two, and then the third increment, we're going to finish the whole thing off, and that's what we're going to do now. And in this case, because we used a dent and shade on the first increment, and that blocks the light, if we want to, we can use an enamel shade here and let it blend it in with the enamel. So it makes it look very lifelike. But I don't know if we have all these shades. I have a feeling that you're going to probably be just using one shade. So we put that on, and then use your gloved finger. Push it in, compress it, shape it. Do you see where we're getting our contact now? Because you're pushing it right up against the Teflon tape like you did with the class three. And then you detail that with uh, a half Hollenbeck or a, a uh, this is a IPC instrument, interproximal carver, but a half Hollenbeck will work just fine. I don't think you have these. And you can go ahead and put you know, shape it so it has mammalons and, and, and just reproduce the shape of the tooth. But here again, I want to emphasize that we want to get it shaped as, as well as we possibly can and save on finishing time. So now we're kind of working it a little bit, forming some mammalons and be, just be looking at the adjacent tooth and do the mirror image of it. And you can do quite a bit. This is just taking a bend of brush and smoothing it out. And you want to look at it from the incisal view to make sure you got the right labial embrasure because that's going to make a big difference in the result. Any question about the labial embrasures? I think you guys understand that. Yes. No, this is all packable. We don't. The only place I personally use flowable is on the gingival margin of a class two, and, and very sparingly, because it, it's got, it, it shrinks more and it polymerizes, and it also is not highly filled so that if it's in the area on the surface, it cups and wears. So this is all done with packable. Okay. So when you're satisfied that it looks like a tooth, go ahead and start curing it. And notice that I'm curing from the lingual because I want to pull that composite right into the tooth. Because it's, it's where the light hits it first and where the bonding agent is, that's where it shrinks. And then you can swing over on the labial and cure it again. So I hope you all understand the rationale for that. Okay, we don't need the Teflon tape anymore, so we'll go ahead and remove it. But we should have a contact now because we were compressing that composite right up against the Teflon tape, which is very thin. And right where the contact is, it's nice and smooth. So any finishing that we do is going to be around the contact and not through it. Because if you start finishing through it, you're going to weaken it. So just to show you that there is a contact, <laughs> I took some floss and so 
It gives us just about the right contact. Okay, so what are we going to use on the lingual? Well, what did you use for a class three? It's a concave surface, so you're going to use a convex instrument like a football. So we're going to start smoothing on the lingual. And this is a good time to uh, take some articulating paper and check the bite so you know how much to take off. So a football on the lingual it can be a diamond or it can be a 12-bladed carbide. And this is a very important step. Once you do that, then take your explorer and check that margin and make sure there are no overhangs and no voids. Looks like there's a little overhang right there, doesn't it? See how it catches? We need to go back in, finish that down. So n never go to the next step until you check with the Explorer and make sure everything is just perfect. And I think I've showed this to you before, but I'll review it quickly. So when you're going from restorative material to tooth structure, and it catches, that means there's a void and you need to add more material. So if there is an overhang, then we just take it down, go back to the burn, take it down. Now we'll go back and check again with the Explorer. And we don't want to fill that margin. We want it to be perfect. You know, you can't see the overhang, but the patient feels it with their tongue. So what's the patient going to think about every time they run their tongue over your restoration and they feel a discrepancy? Are they going to be real excited about referring other people to you? No, they're not. But if they run their tongue over it and it's just as smooth as glass, they're going to tell everybody what a great dentist you are. Now this is called a Packer diamond. You, you know Dr. Packer? Have you guys met him yet? Okay, he teaches uh, some nutrition courses for us. And we have these in the dispensary. I'm not sure that you have it on your burr block. So when it comes time for finishing, uh, just go ask, um, well, actually I'll ask her to pass them out today. This is a very thin um, diamond and it's, uh, not very abrasive, but it really works quite well. So let's watch it in action. So you can actually get in there and shape the embrasures. It's a very fine diamond and it, it smooths things out. And once you've gone over it with this, then you can go to your jiffies or your sandpaper discs. So you'll be introduced to that today. If when you get to the incisal edge, you can kind of turn it this way and level it off. And then on the labial, let's get everything super smooth. And you've done a good job of shaping it before you even polymerized it, so you don't have to do a lot. So this is really a smoothing operation. Now, if the thing is just gross <laughs> and you didn't smooth it down to begin with before you polymerize it, you'll have to use something a little more abrasive. But this is a fine, very fine diamond. And your friend, the number 12 blade, will make sure that there are no overhangs on the gingival margin. This is the best way to get rid of it. Oh, there's a little discrepancy down there. You saw, probably saw a little chip fly off. 
Then you can go to the discs, the graded discs, the medium, fine, and super fine, or you can use the jiffies. Now, if you're using the jiffies, what, what one would you use on a lingual? The point would work well, wouldn't it? Because it's shaped like that. What are you going to use on the labial? How about the cup? Because the cup will smooth, but then because it's concave, it won't flatten the tooth out. It'll maintain your anatomy. Then you can take your finishing strip, and you'll notice that it's gapped. There's no abrasive on it. And so you slip that through the contact and use the narrow ones, not the wide ones, because we don't want to mess with the contact, but we want to get that gingival margin smoothed up. So just remember, you've, you've established a perfect contact. Don't disturb it. And it's nice and smooth because it was composite pushed up against Stephon tape. So it leaves it very smooth. So don't go through the contact. Then we do our final check. Make sure we've got a good contact. It doesn't fray when we pull it up. If it frays, that means you've got to go back with a number 12 blade and get rid of that overhang. You can't feel the margin in either direction with the Explorer. So, and then, then we do the final finishing, and you can use, I guess I'm not showing it here. Okay, you can use the brush that looks like a broom, and that'll polish it. And I think I'm missing a slide here. Maybe it'll come. Okay, so you know how to put a final finish on it because you've done that many times. And then here's our completed restoration. And we're going to be looking for a tooth form and anatomy. We're going to look, be looking for those embrasures being properly formed and then that sort of that little groove right in the middle of it so it creates the mammal arms. And then looking at it from the lingual view, everything looks compatible. So when we get in the lab, uh, I did a printout of this slide, and it'll be on your desk. So let's go in the lab and make it happen.